Ready to go? Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are the Otana School Board. This is Monday. It is the 27th of February. It's 5.30. I'm going to call the meeting to order. And uh, Eric, our attendance tonight? We are just missing Deborah Bando. All right, very good. Let's start with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> First up tonight would be to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Anything we need to change? Anything that we need to pull out? Hearing none. All in favor with an aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Elstad for our mission moment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, so we have our entourage from the uh, <laughs> theater production, our, our staff, and I want to call them up tonight. So Eric Eitram. Uh, Paula Asmus, Pete Ginther, Betsy Cole, Brandon Noble, Kristen Andrix, and Doc Grauberger. Did I miss anybody? Perfect. <clears throat> we have a photo actually tonight up on our screen saver tonight that has in the lower right, um, <laughs> which is a picture from the show. Um, I had a chance to take it in on Friday. It's one of the best I've seen, really it is. Um, tonight, though, we're recognizing our Oatana High School musical staff who have put in countless hours during rehearsals, costume creations, set design and construction, music practices, and more alongside our students to create the fantastic production of Shrek the Musical. We appreciate the time and effort you each put into not only crafting an amazing production, but also building strong relationships with the cast and crew which includes Haley, who is in the pit orchestra, <laughs> and Elizabeth's daughter, Ms. Hedlund's daughter, Callie, yeah. who has a couple of roles, including the Dragon Queen. Uh, with a, it's a fitting send-off as the last musical on the current OHS auditorium stage. And we look forward to all you will be able to accomplish in the beautiful new auditorium um, at our new high school next year, and you can only imagine that that will be uh, to actually have to be able to construct sets in a scene shop, yes. which is adjacent to the stage, <laughs> <laughs> will be something we haven't been able to experience. But if you haven't seen Shrek yet, for all of you out here, you still have two opportunities coming up on fr this coming Friday and Saturday, and I would just add that um, please don't miss it. It's an opportunity to see a number of students engaged in a beautiful expression of art. Mm -hmm. And I so appreciate the love and care mm -hmm. that you provide for our kids. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hold oh, on, Brandon. <laughs> questions? <laughs> You're not done yet, Brandon. There's questions for you. Got it? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have questions? Yeah. How many years of combined? service in this area do you guys have? Uh, I started... I actually just counted the other day. Oh, yeah? I knew I somebody would. Yeah. And yeah. this is my 14th show. Wow. Okay. Okay, so we're at 16. <laughs> as staff, but as a student. Mm -hmm. so. Yep. Yep. This is my first one here. 17, okay. Uh, musicals? Only three that. Uh, well, we've we been even working together for about... 2011 was your first year in the spring. Yeah. So 2012 would have been the first musical. Um, so since then, it's been one a year, except that one year during the, the pandemic. Yeah, so hit it on about 15 years. Right. Mm -hmm. And I started here in uh, 2000 and mm -hmm. uh, started a musical in the fall of 2001 with mm -hmm. Al Zinter. So mm -hmm. we did Oklahoma that fall. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Awesome. Thank you for your commitment to our kids. Yeah, That's I awesome. just have to say, we're, you guys are like, you are truly amazing. I mean, I've been watching you for decades. I mean, 2000, I remember yeah. Oklahoma, and I took my littlest ones there. <laughs> and many of you, you know, worked with those littlest ones as they moved through the high school program. So we're just so fortunate <laughs> to have all your dedication and new folks and new energy. And, um, and Doc, I remember when you came on board. and. 
yeah, you're really um, just a great piece of the culture in Olentana. So thank you very much. Can you steal some of Mr. Kath's thunder and talk a little bit about your pit as it exists today? Now, I was just asking Haley, yeah. who was in the pit, versus pit? the pit that you'll have. I mean, it has to be just night and day difference. Oh, totally. Well, one of the things that will be nice is we won't have to pull any seats out to make a pit first. And that starts the process. As soon as the last event happens before we, we open, we, I kind of look at the kids and I'm like, okay, you know what we need to do now? Everyone get on a chair because we're going to pull this thing out and put it in the ensemble room. And they look at me like, what? Like, yeah, yeah, come on. We'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Just, just you'll be fine. You'll be fine. And then we all do it and just bring them into the ensemble room and plop them down and I have to ask the music teachers first. Like, it's okay if we take your ensemble room for the next uh, few weeks, because mm -hmm. you won't have anything left in there, just chairs. But, you know, so that'll be nice. Uh, one of the things that will be interesting is that the, having the pit out in the open, it's difficult to mix the sound, difficult mm -hmm. to control the sound mm -hmm. at all. So you kind of get what you get. Um, <clears throat> whereas when it's under the stage where it will be, We'll be kind of mixing the sound as we as we go with that, and mm. you know we'll get a little bit less drums. We'll have a little bit more of the piano or keyboards, so we'll be able to control the sound a little bit better than we can at the present. So, and it'll be less disruptive to the audience. I right, mean, right. Right now we have a gigantic <coughs> section that's uh, obstructed view, and uh, that won't be happening in the future. So, terrific. Any other questions? Thoughts, comments? I just have one more. So yeah. what's the musical next year, Mr. Eitrick? Oh, that is, <laughs> that is top no. secret. I bet it is. You have to have very high clearance to get I'll that. Bet it is. <laughs> no, we, we start thinking about it about now and kind of mull of over course. ideas and uh, suggestions are always welcome. So if you have a uh, musical you'd love to see us do someday, let us know. Um, and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. So, Lion King, not yet. Maybe, <laughs> maybe someday. <laughs> maybe someday. Yeah, but we, we talk about it all summer and right. figure out what's going to work. What, I know. You know what's I'm mostly possible. teasing. Because <laughs> I know. And the kids just love it. So love yeah. to, uh, be I, well, I just love teasing them about it. <laughs> That's what it is. It's me. I love teasing them with what, what the musical could be. And, I've even brought scripts home for my own daughter to discover during the summer uh -huh. and then release to the, the <laughs> world, like, it's going to be 42nd Street. I know it because it was on his desk. <laughs> like, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> I just put it there. <laughs> so. Terrific. So, well, yeah. we look forward I just to that. wrap up by saying, you know, as part of our mission moment, our mission here is, sort of, you know, inspiring excellence for every learner every day. You certainly are inspiring excellence, but more so, one of our strategic directives as a district is really high quality teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. This is a testimony to high quality teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations to all. Thank you. And I would also uh, say that Pete Ginther is part of this crew. He's not able to be here tonight. And yeah. we have Roger Scopehammer who works with us. He comes from Bloomington down to help us. Uh, Joe Zastro has been a part of our pit the last few times playing guitar. He's super. Mm -hmm. uh, at that and it's been very helpful. So there's been a lot of people in the community who step up and help and the LTO to, and uh, all sorts of people come coming Your together booster to help club. us. Your booster Theater boosters, right? Your booster yeah, our theater boosters, yeah. Sarah Borgerding and all the people that help with theater boosters are mm -hmm. really critical to our success. So we've been thankful and grateful for them. Great. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Item five tonight is uh, public forum. Sir, do we have any no cards for a public forum tonight? Okay, we will move on. Item six is reports. I'm gonna turn things back over to Mr. Elstad to make some introductions. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Tonight we have uh, some staff and administration from Owatonna High School that are here to do their 20, uh, 21st century, but also just annual presentation. And so without further ado, I will turn it over to Mr. Kapp. Yes, thank you so much for allowing us some time with you this evening. Uh, we're going to give you a little snippet of some stuff that's happening here at OHS. It is not our full picture because um, we'd be here for hours and we know that you have other important business. Um, but before we go on, I would love to have uh, my colleagues uh, introduce themselves and give you a little info on them. Corey Kath, your principal. This is my fourth year at OHS. Phil Wyken, assistant principal. This is my fifth year at OHS. Good evening. I'm Holly Jessica. I'm an assistant principal and this is year seven for me. Good evening, I'm Doug Wanyas. I'm the Interim Dean of Students this year for the first year, but I've been in Owatonna a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's
It's a beautiful picture. Um, that's kind of our highlight right now and some that we're, we're all working towards uh, of our new high school. Uh, as we go through this school year, there's a lot of celebration of this space and who we are um, while we're here. Um, but there's a lot of conversation and work about where we're headed, um, and rightly so. Um, there's a major investment in our community. Um, it's a lot of the work that we are doing this year to prepare our students um, for that next step in their education. Um, not only celebrating our seniors, uh, last graduating class here at OHS, um, but going on to that next step of um, how our education uh, will be enhanced with a new facility. And to give you that, uh, that is really a, a major part of our uh, work right now. Uh, and specifically with a dean of students, um, it has allowed me um, at least two days a week um, to really focus on that next step and what that transition is going to look like for us. And so I want to highlight a little of that tonight, some of the work that we're doing right now um, to make sure that we are prepared for this move. First, uh, a huge thanks to our OHS staff. They have been um, an integral part of this conversation and specifically what this new facility means to education um, because they are truly the ones that are gonna make this work. Um, they are going to be the ones that implement the way that we instruct students differently and put hands-on learning tools and um, new 21st century skills in their hands. And so I cannot thank them enough for always being at the ready um, to sit down, have those conversations about what we think the next steps uh, within this new facility should look like. Part of that is, is kind of the planning and focus, and that's the second bullet point on here, is truly a lot of work right now, kind of wrapping up on the concepts around furniture. And there's a lot of things that people think, you know, like, well, it's just furniture. Um, but to truly understand um, how we are going to um, outfit this facility um, is absolutely uh, with not only bricks and mortar, but it is with furniture as well. The fluidity or the... Um, the opportunities that we have with the new spaces within this school, um, our furniture and that order, and how it is that we started looking at how we want um, the spaces to function, uh, really were exciting. We had students that got to try out a bunch of different furniture last year, um, got to rank some of those about things that um, they saw as beneficial. They got to take a survey about, well, what do they want their classrooms to feel like? How do they want to engage in their classrooms? And how does furniture help enhance that or deter from that? Um, so a lot of really cool things that are happening there, um, wrapping that up over the last uh, couple of months with staff. Um, some highlights I think that come through that are that our students' input was the driver throughout the entire process of um, the purchasing and of outfitting the specific uh, work areas within the school. Um, student input was integral in that. Uh, one thing that I think is really cool that people will start to um, see as they watch as the classrooms come to life is the tiered seating. One thing that students said um, throughout all of this is that they said, if we have spaces where um, in the back of the classroom the seating can be elevated a little bit, so more high top seating, uh, mid-level seating, and then lower seating, so then that way all of us can see the direct instruction. And with having a Chromebook in front of us, we can see what the, uh, the, the direct instruction is there, but then also have at our, uh, at our fingertips um, the work that we are doing right there. So a lot of that um, types or styles of seating. Along with that then is soft seating. Um, students said countless times, um, can we have some soft seating, not just a, a table and chair um, or a desk, but can we also have some um, booths, um, some Ottoman type style um, seating and things like that. So really exciting to see that come to life. Along with that then is the equipment that's necessary to make sure that those um, spaces um, can actually function as a center for learning. So a lot of things around our industrial tech, agriculture, um, within our culinary um, arts because we have a full culinary kitchen. Um, you'll see within the health um, classroom making sure that we're outfitting that to actually look like um, a hospital floor so then that way they understand how they're going to um, do their rounds and to work with um, patients and such. So a lot of real excitement around that equipment and that's really what um, right now is going to drive a lot of our time is making sure that we are ordering that equipment and that it'll be ready in the fall for us. And then finally, professional development. Uh, we need to know how to use the technology, how to use these spaces and all the equipment that's there, and how we are going to function <coughs> together um, within this space. Because so much of our space is what we'd consider shared space. So staff will have offices within uh, the building, and those will be shared offices where um, specific departments or groups of teachers will be. Uh, but then the classrooms themselves are shared throughout the day. And so making sure that we are looking at that and really structuring, okay, now that we will have registration done, how are we going to utilize certain, we call them cul-de-sacs or learning areas uh, within that school, how are we going to use that and what does that look like for the sections that we're going to be offering next year? So a ton of work that's going to go in um, to that, but it'll be driven by our teachers and it'll be driven then by the, the requests that students have made to the courses that they want to take at the new Otana High School next year.
Along with students then, um, we'll be looking at um, 3OT expectations, how it is that we want to engage in specific learning areas of our school, orientation planning, because um, it's really hard to have a link crew give tours and um, show off their new school when they themselves have never gone to school in it. Um, so that's new to us and we're gonna figure that out um, before orientation starts. And then also making the school their own. Uh, we know that students have spaces here. They love um, specific aspects of the tradition and the history of this um, building. Um, but now we wanna make sure that we are providing those opportunities within this new space too. We know they're going to be excited for it, um, but we also wanna make sure that they feel as though it's their space and their uh, ability to uh, connect with it. Corey, what does OT mean? Yes, thank you. Three OT, yes. So the OTs are on time, on task, on target. Uh, and so when we look at anything here at OHS, we use the three OTs quite often, and we love acronyms around these parts in education. Okay, yeah. So uh, with the three OT, it truly is, how are you on time, how are you on task, and how are you on target in all the work that you do here as a student at Owatonna High School? All right, thank you. Absolutely. Now we're going to move on to um, what's going to drive a lot of this new space, and that is the classes that are going to be in that new space. And I'm going to have Mr. Wyken share a little bit about registration. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Um, registration is kind of my life. It's something that I work on, you know, <laughs> and throughout the year. Thank you for that. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. It's definitely an undertaking, but it is really exciting just to see, you know, my first year here as we were kind of planning the the pathways and to see that kind of come together in our registration guide and how far we've come. One of the things I wanted to highlight was just our defining of the areas of study. So when um, students are going through the registration guide, the courses are arranged like in the pathways, but within the pathways, we want students to look at, you know, what are those characteristics and um, you know, areas of study that they're interested in. So we kind of outline their characteristics and the kind of coursework that students, you know, are interested in that fit within those areas of study. So we've kind of narrowed those down in each of our um, pathways to be able to kind of direct students like here are some areas that we've defined that we can kind of uh, align some coursework with. And that's where some of our certifications and, and those also align. So it's a, just a, a way to kind of give students an example of here are some careers that fall into um, you know, this particular pathway. Here are the types of courses that kind of align with that. Here's the characteristics that we see in those um, you know, career areas. And then here's the type of courses that you know um, people often you know excel in that fall into that. So it's just kind of you know making those pathways feel a little bit more robust and um, you know setting that purpose a little bit more. In terms of registration, since COVID, we kind of really you know went paperless and tried to find ways to make sure that we can get materials out to students um, and to, to par parents and families in uh, you know a more efficient way. And so we've kind of gone paperless with our registration guide, our documents. Um, the nice thing about that is we have this ability to have more interactive activities so we can have links, we can have videos, we can have QR codes where you can scan things and um, you know that registration guide can lead you to other you know information that you might need to know about NCAA or AP um, courses. So it's, it's kind of an interesting way to mm -hmm. make that a little bit more interactive than just a, a piece of paper. Um, so we've really kind of pushed students to use their, you know, one-to-one -one devices to register, trying to get students kind of prepared for college. We're not going to have them, like, pick their classes like they do in college, but making them go through that process of, you know, what courses do you need, what courses do you like, and then, you know, obviously kind of pushing um, students to think about what, what career pathways can you see yourself in. And so there's that constant, you know, discussion going on in Compass and within registration to help students just get some experiences not that you're going to come out of high school knowing exactly what you want to do, but being able to say, I've sampled some things. I have, a, you know, an area that's kind of defined where my skills are and, you know, where things kind of line up. And now maybe that is going to lead me to some certifications here. So you have some professional cr credentials kind of going into <coughs> going to college or the workforce. Um, right now, the registration window is open. We opened it um, a little bit early. And that allows us to kind of, you know, get students in there. Um, and we've kind of narrowed our a number of Compass um, registration periods down to three. We had four last year. Um, and we're just seeing as we put more, you know, resources into students' hands that they're able to kind of go through some of these processes quicker than we actually thought. Um, we thought maybe they would need more time. But um, <laughs> we're finding that as this is becoming well-established, it's actually going smoother. We're finding that we're registering more students fully. Um, so we're you know, happy that we've been able to take some of these lessons from adapting to COVID and be more, you know, um, streamlined. 
As kind of an extension of that are the um, areas of fields of study that Mr. Wyken shared with you. Um, and a lot of that de defines um, our career pathways. Um, so we have our three named pathways, and then underneath each of those are fields of study that students can um, initiate or can um, take courses in. And one of our goals is to always say that a field of study shouldn't just have one course. So in other words, we want students to be able to build upon their learning um, throughout their four years with us. And so each year there's proposals that come forward for new courses, and I just want to highlight a few of those. Um, these truly come from our teachers, our staff, and our community that want to enhance the learning of students. And they are so innovative in the work that they do to try and say, hey, I've got an expertise or I have a passion in this area that other students have shared with me. Um, I want to make sure that I extend this opportunity for students in their learning. So some new courses that are being proposed this year that by registration, because remember students then vote with um, their registration of whether or not courses actually take place, um, these are going to be listed as new courses within our registration guide or are in our registration guide. So for math we have AP Pre-Calc. We already have a Pre-Calc course but this what it allows is a student not only to take it as a concurrent enrollment but they also get to take it as an AP. That's really beneficial for our students because there are some colleges that will take a concurrent enrollment credit um, towards something. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some that won't, and so then they will take it as an AP, or then a student could maybe get advanced um, credits uh, within AP. So this really just enhances the opportunities for a student to be able to move that um, to a post-secondary institution. Also aligns the um, curriculum um, nationwide um, and a little bit higher level there um, because of the fact that um, AP uh, really works well within that system of um, teachers of pre-calc throughout the nation. PE and health, um, in that area we're doing a human performance as well as an introduction to emergency care. Now within both of those, human performance is kind of an extension um, of that kinesiology and opportunities mm -hmm. for students to really look at um, occupational therapy and fields within that, um, as well as then the introduction to emergency care is for students that might be interested in one of those healthcare fields. Um, and specifically, this is going to give them that introduction to that um, and specifically emergency care um, that then could also align really well if you want to go into coaching, if you want to go into um, mm -hmm. being an EMT, if you want to go into uh, just, you know, being a, well, citizen that's going to take care of somebody in an urgent situation. So just try to introduce them to that to say, is this something that I would maybe want to extend, maybe go into CNA or to go in the PN program and things. Under business, the Husky Hut, that's our new school store. It's an actual storefront right off of the commons. Um, and so we need to make sure that we're prepared for that. Um, and I'm excited to see that come to life. Under art will be web and computer animation. Uh, that course um, is an extension of a field of study that we already have, which is our graphic arts courses. We have graphic arts one, two, and three, and then this will be a fourth in that, um, in that line of a web and computer animation for students to take. Under ag, what we found is that we have just a great uh, wealth of courses that students can take in our ag area, but they did not have in the um, areas of plant science, they did not have an introduction to it. Um, it jumped into it after you've taken a couple of other courses that may not actually be aligned to plant studies. So this is going to be a way to um, bring an introduction to students so that they can see which avenues around plant science that they would like to go into and will actually help us enhance our higher level courses um, to a little bit um, higher rigor because now they can do an introduction to a, a plant science. And then, of course, under PSEO, concurrent health sciences. So these are um, classes that will be taught um, with a uh, concurrent uh, professor would be our firefighter one and two and then Health Foundations 1 and 2. Both of these um, are absolutely in partnership with Riverland um, that we have with a grant with them and uh, with our local fire department. Uh, and so we are very excited uh, about the opportunities that those will pose for students that are interested in firefighting as well as then um, to move within our PN program um, beyond CNA. So really excited about that. Again, like I said, um, students will uh, you know, decide whether or not these move forward. Um, our hope is that over a rotation of the next few years that we'll get more and more students interested in them and that they will enhance our career pathways. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Jessica and Mr. Wanius um, to chat a little bit about our COMPASS program that's an extension of career pathways as well as then um, our support for students. So you've heard a little bit about our career pathways and our registration. Our COMPASS program is really where our students get the opportunity to learn more about that. Our COMPASS program began about three years ago. Students always had an advisement period. You may have heard of TMM prior. That was <laughs> the similar thing. It has moved into COMPASS, um, really kind of like the name, to guide students into their path, to um, help them to be able to make some more choices. This year is the first year that um, students have uh, been able to divide into one of the career pathways. So your sophomore year going into your junior, you can choose one of the career pathways that you can have an advisor that is teaches in that area or has some more knowledge in that area that could maybe guide you some more, answer some more questions. Um, this doesn't 
put a kid in a pinhole and make them have to go into that pathway. They're able to take classes kind of throughout um, whatever we offer, um, but just provides an additional contact. Um, we really listened to our students and our staff and our families and a lot of those daily desired experiences and kind of how we can provide more opportunities for students, having kind of that one person that they can connect to, ask specific questions, and if that advisor doesn't maybe know those answers to that question, they would have a wealth of other people that they know that they could connect them with and um, get that student's questions answered. Um, throughout, I don't have a mouse. Mm -hmm. So click here for an example. So students, students each week are, <laughs> um, it happens on the first and third, um, there we go, first and third Wednesday of each month and students um, are sent a s'more. So parents, um, you would receive this as well. It, is outlined for each grade level and it gives each grade level um, the information that they need on what they're going to accomplish within their compass period. So it might be an activity in Naviance to kind of explore some more um, college and career interests. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, give them some more information on some, maybe some other things that are going on, like testing is in my brain right now because those are things that are coming up for me, all of their information for registration. So these are also things that they can go back to at any time. So you can kind of see that they're all, th all throughout there. Um, which one is mine? Thanks. So students and parents receive this, the Compass newsletter, every time. Um, so they, they get it each the first and the third. Um, and then we are also throughout this have been able to, thank you, um, provide some interventions for our students. Um, one of the biggest things and has been a really great partnership and having Doug being able to be a part of our administrative team is really targeting a lot of our students that maybe struggle with some attendance or truancies or maybe need some other interventions and maybe need a lot of that one-to-one, -one, those contacts. Um, so he's done a lot of work with that. So I'd like to invite him up to share a little bit about that as well. All right, in addition to what Ms. Jessica said about um, Compass being your kind of advisement time, um, every other Wednesday, the Compass schedule aligns itself where there's a, usually class starts at 8.10. During Compass Wednesdays, class starts at 8.25. That gives a, a, an additional time before school for students to go and receive any sort of additional help. It serves as a good intervention for you know, students who might be busy after school or uh, involved, highly involved, so they can have an opportunity to meet with an instructor in a classroom uh, before school from that time frame, and then also at the end of the school day. Usually the school day runs till 2.40. On Compass Wednesdays, it's a, basically a 2 o'clock to 2.40 intervention time, um, where again, students are encouraged to take part in um, intervention type of strategies, make up tests, get additional uh, support, <laughs> ask questions they might not want to ask in a classroom setting. That extra time after school, uh, between 2 and 2.40 is also for um, additional like, club activities. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the pieces is you see, we've seen an increase in the DECA uh, participation, the increase in key club, um, because that gives the opportunity for students to get involved with that kind of stuff. Um, one of the big pieces for me, as Ms. Jessica mentioned too, is the WIN group. And now understand that I'm not the smartest uh, tool in the shed. So my philosophy is just win today. Don't worry about down the road because down the road will take care of itself. So you take care of today by winning today. So I thought, okay, what could our, our group name be? Well, the win group. Pretty good, right? Um, so the win group is basically the 20 to 30 students whom we have identified as either attendance or academic um, need. And uh, they're on the win group, which then means I will follow up with them daily. It's basically check in the classrooms they're in, see if they're there participating, because we believe being in class is a big part of their academic success. As Mr. Kath had mentioned, the three OTs, we believe in being on time, the punctuality, that's a job skill. Okay, being on task, get the phones away, focus on the academics when you're in school, and then being on target, being on target to make grades for graduation so we can walk the stage and get that <coughs> diploma. Um, so as part of the WIN group, they hear this from me every day. 
they'll see me at least and make sure I check in and make eye contact with those students knowing that you know someone is advocating for them on a regular daily basis. Um, the, in addition to all of that then is we follow up every compass day at two o'clock with a win meeting and the group will get together. We have some incentives that our community has also partnered with, with us. It might be um, Taco John's or it might be Oatana, uh, home to the bagel shop or it could be red and green burrito or others. And if students have had perfect attendance, they'll get an incentive. Um, you know, some have said, well, you're bribing us. Well, not really. It's more of an incentive. I, I reached out to some of our employers and said, what do you do if your shift um, goes without any injury? What if your shift meets yeah. productivity? What type of incentives do you have there? So we kind of uh, balance the incentive with our program to help it be a job-like situation. And as much as we can, we also try to partner students in a group, the old uh, cooperative learning strategies, so they win together um, and work together and support each other. So we've seen uh, a 41% drop in student failures this year. Um, and I also would attest to the fact that our, our win group from first semester, um, every student um, successfully uh, passed at least one of their courses. That might not sound like a big deal, but to us it is. It's a big deal for, for those who have struggled in the past to all of a sudden take a little more pride and find some more success and, and realize school isn't that bad place, that they can find success. And you know ultimately, that's what um, the WIN group is about. That's ultimately what education at Oatana High School is about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. What he didn't tell you is that 38% of those kids pass three or all of their classes. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. Um, one of the things when, first of all, this is an amazing team um, that I have working with me and I am so proud of the energy and effort that they put in and their expertise each and every day. And what I love is that um, we will, um, on our Monday morning meetings, we will challenge one another to say, what are our next steps? How are we going to get better? How are we going to grow? And how are we going to do better for kids? Uh, and that is truly um, what you see in each of these topics in these areas. Yes, we may um, have to you know, differentiate and each of us take kind of different tasks and things, but we come together as a team and make sure that we're moving forward um, together, knowing that OHS is going to be better when we know uh, that, that we're all in this energy and in this effort um, to, to be there for kids. So a lot of fun uh, and a lot of great um, outcomes that are coming from this work. Uh, with that, we'll open it up to any questions that you might have. Seeing none, see you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Oh, you answered the OT question, so. Yeah, we got the three OT out of the way. Yeah. No, but thank you for what you guys are doing. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's good stuff. Doing really good stuff. Thank you. I got, well, I got a couple, but I'll, um, thinking about the new building, um, and I'm really excited and intrigued to see and hear how the department teachers, you know, function when they don't have the assigned classroom and they have their offices and sort of that collaborative. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how, you know, you talked about the desks. I don't know why this is so intriguing to me, but what does the front of the classroom look like? In other words, as the classroom teacher comes in, sort of how do they occupy that space. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, no, that's and very good. And what's the furniture there or what isn't yeah. there? So within um, every classroom, uh, the design was that there is a teaching wall. Uh, and so there's a space that um, would be what you would say is the directed front of a classroom um, for a teacher to be able to present information, share goals, um, to project the work of that day, things like that. But keep in mind, we moved um, through COVID to a one-to-one -one device where students can access all of their resources online. And I go into classes now where there are times where you you don't really see a front of a room because there doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. It's students that are sitting on four sides of a table um, facing each other and throughout the entire hour the teacher is working um, throughout that classroom and working with individual clusters of students and there is no like direct instruction where it's sit get and then um, mm -hmm. now I push you mm -hmm. off to, to do your work. Doesn't mean that that doesn't happen and shouldn't happen because it does and there's really really good intentional work that happens with that too. But I think that's the idea is that we want to make sure that every classroom at the new high school has that functionality where there can be that type of uh, engagement and that the multiple aspects of engagement
engagement. So each classroom will have that teaching wall. Each classroom will, of course, be outfitted for um, student seating that is flexible. In other words, um, that as courses change throughout the school year, you can swap out desks, chairs, tables, high tops, low tops um, with furniture that's out in our learning commons or the open area of that, uh, of that pod or cul-de-sac of classrooms with then also the, the class. You could change it out on a daily basis based on what it is that you're doing that day. You might be doing group work for a week um, and so you want clusters of tables for students to be able to work and to um, function that way. You might have a presentation where you're going to open up two classrooms together, um, put 60 to 80 students and they can have a presentation by Community Pathways coming in and sharing about the work that they're doing um, in a specific area. So that flexibility was really important to us and then the furniture reflects that as well of making sure that then as classrooms are utilized, um, what is the functionality um, and, and the teaching needs of that class itself. There will be a teacher station in each of those classrooms. So there's a podium um, to be able to just have your you know, logistical type items. There will be a teacher table um, that a teacher can be at um, so that a student can come up and get, um, get help if they need to or connect with a teacher and things like that. Um, and then, of course, then the flexibility of they also will have their teacher uh, office um, space so then that classroom can be used four hours of the day rather than right now, um, for the most part, three hours a day. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. So since the classrooms are more designed to be like online kind of work, do you think there'll be an increase in hybrid classes or like flex kind of classes where br the brunt of the work is independent? Yeah, so in a lot of our conversations with teachers is that um, the, the concept around a hybrid or the idea of what the individual needs of that student are should be what really drives the work that we do. So there are some students that absolutely can function at that um, level of um, independent learning, um, can use um, whether it's videos that are presented, whether it's um, direct teacher instruction for a short period of time, and then the student goes off on um, work that they can do independently. Mm -hmm. But we never want to lose that connection or that touch to that student that needs that, that needs that intervention in that moment. Um, because you may say that, hey, I've got this. I can run with this right now, and I have that independent time. We also want to make sure that uh, we give that opportunity for those students that need to have that one-to-one -one or that direct instruction from that teacher, uh, that that will be a part of their, uh, their school day as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where, when the design was coming forward, that it was that idea of that there's enough flexibility so that Therefore, there can be um, independent learning. So in other words, our learning commons or our media center is a wide open space. So where if we have students doing online coursework or students that are doing PSEO but need a place for Wi-Fi to be able to do that work, they can use that as a flex learning space for themselves. So within that, the design was there. But we also know that many students, and especially many of our classrooms that are hands-on, so uh, we are not going to send kids home with a welder. Uh, we're going to do that in that station, and we're going to make sure that they are safe you know, and, ha and have that connection. So then those classrooms are actually designed designed to make sure that is the focus of that. But then let's make sure that those general classrooms like you referred to are wide enough uh, or open enough where they have the flexibility at their disposal so that um, two, three, four years down the road as things are continuing to ebb and flow and change for student needs that the um, function of that space can do the same thing. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You describe a lot of flexibility with these classrooms and can you talk a little bit about the science classrooms because I think when I walk through the science classrooms now there's just a tremendous amount of stability with tables and desks and that sort of thing. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so um, our science classrooms are going to feel a little bit more traditional in some of that um, sense, but what we do like is that the lab stations themselves um, are much more adaptable. First of all, they um, are ADA compliant, which is new to us because um, ours are currently are not, and so we are excited about the fact that any of our students that have, have ambulatory needs would um, be able to um, function well in any of those classrooms. Beyond that then, um, the actual function of them is to make sure that it is about lab partners and lab stations where there is um, group work or functionality of being able to do um, lab work as um, clusters of four to six students. And so the way that they are set up then is to have those demonstrations and to be able to see and focus on where is the teacher at, but then now I get to independently work um, on what I need. The other aspect of that too is the flexibility of those lab stations. So you talked a little bit about those really rigid stationary tables. Um, there are a couple of stations. We don't really want a lot of chemicals moving in a chemistry lab. So you really want those to have some sturdiness and to um, have the ability to make sure that you're meeting all the safety needs. But in a biology or physics station, we want to have as much flexibility as we can so that they can actually run experiments. So the physics lab, for instance, is absolutely everything is on wheels. They can 
um, gut the entire middle of that room and there's a large bar that goes all the way around it that is electrified so that they can plug things in or they can have things hanging from it um, and they can use it as just one giant um, experimental station for them if they want to. Um, so having that flexibility again then allows them to run that class with whatever experiments that they need um, within that space rather than always having to find it or adapt an experiment that maybe doesn't fit the entire needs of what the class needs. Well, I can keep going, so <laughs> I, I'll pause and let one of you jump in here. All right, I got one. Yeah. All right. Um, Corey, we've talked about this before, so maybe you can just um, address the question again. Sometimes I have constituents who have students who maybe don't take advantage of the compass opportunities and see it, you know, as a, oh, I get out of school at 2 o'clock day. Um, can you talk about maybe steps you've taken or what you're finding in terms of the student population, what, what portion of the population is engaged, or what do you do to try to capture some of those kids so they don't walk out the door? Yeah, so when we talk about the concept around flex time, it truly is about rewarding students and recognizing students that they have choice. And the idea that um, in our lives we all have choice mm -hmm. uh, and about what it is that uh, we need to do with our time. And so micromanaging that time once they get to high school, one of our goals was to say that it shouldn't just be assigned. It shouldn't be something that you just say, you must go do this now, or we're just going to put you in a room mm -hmm. and hope that um, there's something that you get out of this um, or that it's worthwhile. So what we wanted is that there needed to be ownership. Students had to be able to own that time. And from there then is how do we help guide that? How can we create student organizations that students want to be involved in, that are student-led, mm -hmm. student-run, um, that students say, I, I want to make this happen. You saw on our last slide, DECA went up by 25%. Key Club went up by 40%. 40% mm -hmm. more students then are staying in that time to go do something that is about giving of their time um, in civic organizations across our community. Yeah. So that means students wanted that flexibility. They wanted that opportunity to engage in that. From teachers, for instance, and one of the telltale signs is that we had a couple of winter storms. I know it's crazy, but we had to actually miss out on two compass days uh, where mm -hmm. students did not get that flex time. And I had about a dozen teachers go, we need to get those back. We have to have those two flex days back mm -hmm. again because I had a dozen students that needed to come in and do this or they want mm -hmm. to do this. They are now using that time. So what's really fun to see is that if you give them control of it and you allow the students to say, this is your time, you get to actually manage that, what we are finding now is that students are becoming more wise about that mm. time itself. But the flip there is, is that, for instance, I'll use uh, my daughter, she would hate that I'm doing this, but I will use her as an example. Um, she needed to get some laundry done. She had to figure out her homework because she had dance that then um, also had that evening till 8 p.m. And she knew that that 50 minutes that she had there, she got to get all of that stuff done so that when she had dance and she got home, she could get a good night's sleep too. Yep. So there's something to be said about that too, that a student then is making decisions about their use of time and saying that, yeah, it is limited, and what do I need for me? And it's really fun to hear students talk about that, about mm -hmm how they truly relish the fact that we are treating them like the adults that they are. <laughs> and um, of course though, you know, with, whether it's the win group, whether it is um, looking at intervention, um, there is some nudging because there mm -hmm. are a lot of parent mm -hmm. phone calls and parent emails mm -hmm. um, that are used by our teachers to say, I need to see your child today. I need them to be a part of this, uh, this intervention time with me because they have fallen behind and I want this to be uh, a part of what their day looks like. And those partnerships are amazing. On top of that, then, through our truancy work or attendance review board and mm -hmm. things like that, um, we also will nudge students um, in saying, this is what our expectation of your time is because you need this for you. Yep. Uh, but again, it is that idea that uh, this is truly flexible time for them, and we want to teach them um, the value of time. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Corey, along those lines, are you getting any feedback from parents directly, either positive or negative, about the Compass Days? Yeah, so from last year to this year, so the compass time shrunk um, quite substantially this year, mostly because we thought that last year students were going to use, because we had two kind of 45 minute chunks last year, and we thought students would want two type of activities. And what we found is no, students wanted one activity, or that's what they kept saying to us in the work that we were doing, uh, that I want one thing. I need to either go to a club or a group or an activity because that is actually something that is valuable to me in that time, or no, I need to go see a teacher. And those two things um, can happen simultaneously. They can happen, um, you know, like somebody can go for a few minutes to a key club, then go see their teacher or vice versa, or I'll take a test and then go um, do this. 
So when we have different groups that come forward, I know Mr. Uh, Elsted um, works with a lot of our students um, in kind of finding out from uh, his, his group of how are they utilizing that time, what does that look like, um, and a lot of the feedback that he gets as well as that I get in interactions with students is that this provides me with what I need to be able to independently uh, work with them. From parents, it is, yes, my child will be assigned to that, and this is where they are going to go. Um, and then what I love, though, is that there's a sense of accountability there. Hey, congratulations. I'm so glad that you went um, to go meet with so-and-so today because mom contacted us and said that this is what you're going to be doing. Or Mr. Keller said that you showed up today um, for that. What an awesome thing that you followed that instruction, um, that parents said this is a wise use of your time. Let's make sure that that happens. Also, the fact that um, as we talk to parents is that um, when they're out, whether you know, with basketball or um, they have a job right after school or they have to watch little brother or sister, the constant conversation we get is, when can my child come in and take that test? I don't even know when I can um, help them. Well, actually, we do have that every other week, so twice a month, um, we have this opportunity to use Compass Time. And so parents do like that because there are uh, commitments that students have at that you know, 3, 3.30 um, that they cannot stay after school then to, to meet that requirement of making up that test or connecting with that teacher. Beyond that, though, I think that's uh, important as well, though, is that when we have that conversation or when we look at that, then it's um, saying, now you got an outcome from this. Look at this. You are at passing now. You're meeting our 3OT expectation of a C or higher in those classes. Um, you're now going to be able to celebrate that um, with your teacher um, and us as administrators recognizing you've met your goals. Uh, and what a great celebration. And it was at time that you made that choice um, to be able to utilize that flex time. Yeah. Many students do ask for it every week. Um, <laughs> and at this stage, we are not ready to do that. I would add, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have a student advisor at the high school, middle school, and ALC, and when I come to the high school student advisory, I have some general questions that I'll inquire with them, and, and um, what's going well, um, the compass time is always, always the first item they mention. For the very reasons, and because it's a very interesting mix of students, because uh, they just come from different backgrounds. They have different um, <coughs> loves of school, perhaps I'll mm -hmm. use that way. Mm -hmm. But I think they all find some value. So some that are interested in key club or other clubs, while others will say, if I'm going to stay on target, I have got, and they'll use the words on target. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to stay on target, I have to be part of this compass time with my teachers. So I think there's just, I love the flexibility Student autonomy, I sometimes ask, what if we just trusted the kids? Mm -hmm. the and on top of that, like what you brought up is like we have a games club or a Rubik's Cube club. This was a group of kids that just loved doing that, and they found a teacher that would um, be their advisor. Started working through that, and then what we found out is that teacher, while they're sitting in there, would go through their grades and would bring them up on uh, their infinite campus say, hey, show me how you're doing in your classes. Mm -hmm. And then two of them got encouraged to say, you need to go talk to your teacher before you come back to Rubik's Club <laughs> next time, and I want to know that you're at. And it's so yeah. cool to see that because they have a trusting partnership or a, a, a really cool relationship with that teacher, and they now have mentored them to say, now let's use your time even a little bit better um, because you want to be here and doing this, but it means that then you should have accomplished what you needed to in that course. Um, so pretty cool to see that because that wouldn't have happened otherwise because they probably wouldn't have connected with that instructor, if that makes sense. Yeah. So there's those relationships that are happening happening um, that then, uh, you know, that, that are also guiding students um, in making some really good use of their time. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a few closing comments. You know, I'd, um, I've been fortunate enough to walk these halls and work in this building. And uh, your comments about staff here, Mr. Kath and others, is um, the staff here is second to none. And we're very fortunate to have that staff, but it takes great leadership. I also know and I see when I walk in this building the administrative support that people are receiving. You cannot lead from your desk in this building. You have to be present and visible. And when I call the office and I say, can I speak with Mr. Kath? And your assistant says, he's out working with kids right now in the hallway. I say, perfect. When he gets back. But I appreciate that. That visibility and I see it with Mr. Wanyas, I see it with Ms. Jessica and Mr. Wyken as well. You are out and about building relationships with kids because that's what it's all about. Mr. Wanius, I love the comments about win today. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in those shoes with the 20 to 30 students <laughs> that need that gentle nudge. And I would tell you that even to this day, and this has been a long time since I served as an administrator in this building, I will see kids in the community at the fair typically. And it's usually one of the 20 or 30, 30. 
that will come up to me and give me a big hug or a high <laughs> five and then they'll say, look what I'm doing now. And all it took was that relationship. So thank you. Thank you for your thank leadership. You. Yeah, this is, um, this is a fun time to be able to uh, thank um, the high school staff as they're, they're departing. Um, you know, we're really lucky as school board members, we're merely a layer of osmosis between a school district and a community. We have a great chance to hear what happens in our schools and we get to share that message with the community and by the same token, when community brings ideas, thoughts, concerns and issues to us, um, all of you are always so incredibly receptive and, and capable of, um, of hearing us out when, when we have these concerns. Mr. Wyken, um, freely admit, we occasionally have a meeting here at the high school in your, the office, in the, the conference room in the office, and I always slow down. I'm in a hurry, but I always slow down because if your door is open, I look at the whiteboard. Because <laughs> the whiteboard in Mr. Wyken's office, that's like, that's like an astronomy code for some sort of <laughs> space vehicle. How you coordinate all that stuff mm. beyond me. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to move on. Item seven tonight <clears throat> is just general, not just, it's general information. And specifically tonight, we have um, good news on the enrollment report in that uh, there are no red cells with regard to um, student population in classrooms. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Elstad with regard to the enrollment report? Hearing none. We're going to move on. Um, item eight, which would be uh, for discussion only, board forum. Jelaine, I'm going to start down on your end. Do you have anything for board forum tonight? Um, no, not for board form. I'm going to do a deep dive when we get to policy. Gotcha. So. Thanks. Laura, do you have anything? Um, yeah, Jolene, I'll tell you about our policy committee. Um, I'm feeling good about, I think, how we're functioning. You know, we're meeting once a month, and we've got a lot to get through, but we just keep uh, plugging away. Finance is coming up, so a few of us will have that on our agenda soon. I saw the play. Don't mm. miss it. Your daughter was awesome. It was really, really fun. And then uh, science fairs. I just want to say when I read that admin report um, and just seeing yeah. – you know, all the science fairs and the math contests and the music. This It was really just heartwarming to feel like we're back a little bit. So I'll get to judge a science fair coming up. Looking forward to that. So I have it. nothing for board form tonight. Eric? Uh, I have nothing for tonight. Tim? Nothing. Elizabeth? Nothing extra. How about you, Haley? Um, this is a really busy time for the high school, I mm. think, for every student. Um, Lots of things are going on. We just had snow week last week and it went really well, even though it was kind of cut short by all of the snow days. <laughs> um, mock trial just got made it to state, so we have that this week, which is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, DECA state is this week as well, so like everything is going on all at the same time, so everyone's super busy, but it's going really well. So. Nice. Good. Glad same. to hear that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I, we are now at, at item one, which is policy revisions. And Jolene, do you mind if I turn things over to you for some sure updates? Sure, Take some notes. Here we go. Um, Policy met last week, did a lot of work as usual, reading policies, making sure it aligns with practices and vice versa. Um, a bulk of the work was just revision of language to make sure it's up to date with state and federal mandates. Um, the budget, accounting, investment, policy areas, we just cleaned up some minor references and you know spelled out some Minnesota statute or you know readjusted the abbreviations. Uh, policy 707 transportation of public school students there mm -hmm. was some language in there that we added to include a physician assistant in the medical industry there's um, some of our students just need some different types of transportation and in order to receive that different type of transportation there has to be some sort of medical note or diagnosis and so with the way that the medical field is going we included physicians assistant and so we would accept that as well and then the video recording on school buses, that was a fun policy to read because it was very 1985. Like, <laughs> the video camera has to have a box in the bus, and that's just not the way the technology is anymore. And so we updated the language to reflect current technology, availability, um, a variety of different bus models and options and then we also looked at the video surveillance and made sure and with the recording made sure that we're maintaining and storing the data that aligns in a way with state and federal guidelines and mandates so that was the bulk of the work that we did so any mm -hmm. questions happy to answer anything thank you enjoy reading the updated ones 
What was that? I enjoy reading the updated ones versus the old policies. That <laughs> yeah, it, it's yeah that video recording one was just 1985, so that mm. was kind of interesting, but all good stuff. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we're going to move on. Item B would be the administrative report. Mr. Elstad, do you have anything for the administrative report before we dive into um, Michelle Krell's presentation? If it's okay as part of the administrative report, Mr. Chair, I'd like to have um, Michelle come and talk first. Um, about our American Indian education uh, requirements for the district. And then if I could conclude, if that's okay. Perfect. With the yep. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee. Um, Leanne Jim is our chairperson, but she was unable to be here today. But I wanted just to report that our American Indian Parent Advisory Committee met on February 22nd. Um, this is a time where we get together, we talk about um, the education that their children are getting. Um, we share some information on standards and how American Indians are infused within the standards of Minnesota. Um, and then really find out what are the needs of their students and if we're meeting those needs. And so it was a great meeting. Um, always enjoy that meeting. We're actually more planning a, an event for this spring where we'll bring all the families together for a family night and hopefully serve some, some food that is part of their culture and um, just really have an opportunity for them as families to connect. And so as part of um, our requirement by the Minnesota Department of Education is that we need to take a vote of concurrence. And so what that is is we're finding out whether or not our American Indian families believe that we're providing a sound education in Oatan Public Schools for their children. And I'm pleased to say that the American Indian Parent Advisory Committee is very happy about the education that their children are getting and they, they issued a vote of concurrence. Um, so, any questions about that? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Elstad. Yeah, I'll conclude with a couple <coughs> administrative notes. Uh, as I mentioned in my uh, update to the board packet, uh, the legislature, of course, is something I pay attention to um, at this point, they're still working at a very feverish pace, although last week um, with our snowstorm, they slowed down considerably uh, because of the mm -hmm. weather. Um, but a couple of uh, bills of interest, one of them I pointed out to you is the Universal Meals for All Students. Passed the House, it's now uh, awaiting Senate, um, a hearing in the Senate as well as when they're moving to the Senate floor. Um, we also heard uh, some special education cross-subsidy financial support, which is something we're a real proponent of uh, to help us increase uh, the general fund uh, and take away some of those cross-subsidy needs. Uh, the other one that I uh, just recently testified on was House File 1271 around equalization. I'm not going to go into this again because I feel like I talk about this at every board meeting because I'm passionate about making sure that our students have the same opportunities but that our taxpayers don't have to pay triple what other uh, districts taxpayers have to. Um, I feel the most confident that I felt in my 11 years as a superintendent about where we're at with equalization mm -hmm. at this point. Um, it's finding um, bipartisan support in both the House Committee, there's a companion bill in the Senate as well uh, that Senator Jasinski shared with me has got some uh, real legs as well. So I feel good about that. Um, should we see that equalization um, our taxpayers will see almost immediate results with that for their uh, pay 24 taxes. Um, so again, that would be a real benefit to our community uh, to see those taxes go down. Uh, but yet our students will still get the same opportunities that they have and, and uh, the zip code shouldn't matter. So I'll leave that. Uh, other news, February forecast was released today. Uh, it's good news when the February forecast matches up with what we received over the summer. Uh, at this point, um, according to the resources that were shared today, uh, we still have a $17.5 billion surplus. Um, Governor Walls spoke a little uh, briefly today about his education targets and feels that uh, that surplus um, still puts his targets in line. Um, so we'll see where that goes. And we've got um, a long time yet, May 22nd. Um, hmm. It'll come quick, but um, the legislature is working fast. I'm scheduled to testify one other time, I think, next week um, on another bill of concern. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to represent our school district and our community, the legislature, advocating for our students and staff and community. Uh, a couple other items. Um, I mentioned before that I'm part of the Riverland presidential search. 
Mm -hmm. uh, last week, we narrowed a list of candidates from 39 down to 14. Um, it was, it's a very extensive search. And uh, next week, I'll be participating in uh, interviews uh, with those candidates. Uh, two full days of interviewing. Um, so it'll be about seven and a half to eight hours a day uh, of interviewing candidates. But um, it's encouraging to see such a talented pool of mm -hmm. candidates. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a vested interest because of our future interests in Riverland and making sure that we have a quality post-secondary partner for our school system. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, our winter sports season is kind of drawing to a close and I just want to give you uh, some brief notes about that. Congratulations to our gymnastics team mm -hmm. who were third at the state AA gymnastics meet. Uh, congratulations to Cole Pipo who advanced in the state swim meet uh, that will be this weekend. Uh, we have 10 wrestlers that advanced to the state wow. tournament. Um, eight males and two females advanced uh, in their weight classes. Uh, as, ha as Haley mentioned, mock trial is going to state. We're proud of them as well. They, they won the regional meet and now are headed to the federal courthouse, I think, later this week for their competition. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just briefly wrapping up that uh, we, in our conference this year, we had two big nine champions thus far in the winter season, uh, both our gymnastics team and girls hockey. So uh, it's wonderful to see uh, the front end of our meeting valuing and really putting, lifting up our theater department and the, and the part that's those things that are important to our students, but also some of our other activities as well. So that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Item nine tonight is our consent agenda. Quick reminder, we are approving the minutes from January 23rd and the work session of February 13th, disbursement as well as personnel report. Does anybody have a reason or a request that we would pull one of these items? Hearing none, we'll entertain a motion to approve. I move that the board approve the consent agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second. Eric, if you would please. Yep. Elizabeth? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jolene? Aye. Lori? Aye. Mark? Aye. Nine myself and I. Six will pass. Motion carries. Thank you. Item 10 tonight uh, starts with uh, several items that the board needs to uh, take action on. First, start and end times for the 2023 2024 school day. I'm going to turn things back over to Mr. Yeah. Elstead. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We approve the personnel report. Don't we have to do that one separately? No, uh -uh. that's consent. Okay. Because yep. we did a roll call. Because we did. Okay, thank you. It's captured. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so uh, the start and end time item that is being uh, lifted up for your consideration this evening was introduced to you at our work season, work session on February 13th. Um, just if I can recap the why here, um, we're having to change our start times and end times to accommodate. Um, the additional riders that have now um, come to our knowledge. We have about 700 new riders uh, because of the location of the new high school. Uh, just as a recap, we have a, we ha we have a, a two-tiered bus system in that we're able to uh, bring kids in pick, and then drop them off, pick up some other kids and bring them back, which helps with the efficiency of our busing system. Um, the alternative to any change like this would result, quite frankly, into the bus company having costs that are onerous. Uh, and in turn, those costs come to our taxpayers and to our school district. So we are proposing that you consider approving the change in start time. Um, I do want to add one uh, piece to it. At our work session, there was a concern lifted up about the later time for our K-5 learners. Um, and many of our folks in the community might have an 8 o'clock um, work time start. Um, we have always had early morning or morning supervision for our K-5 students, and we would continue to do that and offer that um, opportunity so that parents that do need to drop their children off or are choosing to drop their children off, uh, that they would be able then to um, get to their locations by their work time that they've had for probably years. But um, that was one of the things that would, was lifted up. Uh, but again, it's really just looking at how do we efficiently and effectively uh, safely transport our students to school and um, moving this a bit and it's in great conjunction the bus company does all of their routing they've got a master router that spends hours on this trying to figure out the best way for us to do this and so when they brought it to us as a recommendation um, again we bring this and lift it up to you for your consideration as a board mm -hmm. any questions I, Eric I know has this uh, motion all queued up. I move that the board prove the school hours to be 8, 10 a.m. to 2.40 p.m. for grades K through 5, 7.50 a.m. to 2.20 for grades 6 through 8, 
8.20 a.m. to 2.50 p.m. for grades 9 through 12, beginning with the 2023-2024 school year. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yeah, maybe just a comment, Mark. I just wanted to just make sure our public and our constituents know and understand that at the last work session you made mention of this, you know, that we vetted this conversation and this issue and, mm -hmm. you know, it does has, have some impact on folks and we know that it's going to mean change um, and adjustment, but again, given the price tag of buses um, that would be required to do it otherwise, um, we still think it's the right mm -hmm. choice and, yeah, not a quick decision, but nonetheless a decision we have to make. So. Agreed. Anything else? All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. No, that was just a voice vote. Um, item B tonight is policy revisions. Now, this is the second reading. We had a, uh, ample opportunity um, at the last meeting mm -hmm. <clears throat> to go through these and, and further clarification from Jolene tonight. Yep. Uh, yeah. Any further questions or concerns with regard to the policies in this revision? I just want to circle back around to 534, the school mm -hmm. meals policy that I asked to be pulled last month. Mm -hmm. Talk to more about that. The, what this adjustment is doing is it's making sure that our practice of giving our students lunch through the regular lunch line is consistent with the policy. Mm -hmm. And so we've never altered, um, regardless of student meal balance, we've never altered their option regarding the main lunch line. And so this policy just reflects the actual practice. Yep. Well, what we're doing. A student current or a student behind gets the exact same exact lunch. Exact same right? lunch, yes, correct. So any observer yeah. would see no difference yep. in how they're treated. Exactly. Yeah, just treated the same. Yep, exactly. yep. absolutely. Uh, Jolene, do you happen to have this motion queued up? Um, I have it here. Okay, Lori, thank you. I move that the board approve the policy revisions as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Uh, lastly tonight would be item C, which are gifts to the district. And Mr. Elstad, there was a long <laughs> list of gifts to the district this time. Yes, and deserves an explanation. So we have a number of sort of um, varying amounts, gifts that um, were made to Owatonna Middle School for Husky Pride Day. Um, I believe that this winter may have a little vengeance with it because especially for middle school Husky Pride Day <laughs> because it was planned for December 23rd originally and was postponed because of a weather cancellation. It was then designed for January um, and we had another weather postponement during that time. So at this point the middle school said we're not going to be able to run the first semester Husky Pride Day unfortunately. And so all of the folks that are listed on here made some sort of a monetary gift um, you know, as part of their support about Husky Pride Day. All of the folks on here, um, well, every person was contacted and was shared, would you like your money back? Um, the other option they had was to leave it as a donation. And all of the folks that you see listed on the list here uh, indicated that they just wanted to let the middle school have it for the next Husky Pride Day donation. Mm -hmm. So that's why, and again, this is in accordance with policy that when gifts are made to the district, that we have to uh, bring those up for your uh, consideration of approval. And then I will note that just on the back, um, one of our longtime middle school staff members, Sue Hardy, um, a, a bench and two plaques uh, were donated in memory of Sue Hardy uh, to our middle school. That's very nice. So that is my report on gifts to the districts. Very good, thank you. One of you happen to have this queued up? I move that the board approve the resolution for acceptance of gifts as presented. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion on this? Eric, if you would, please. Yep. Elizabeth? Aye. Tim? Aye. Jolene? Aye. Lori? Aye. Mark? Aye. And I myself an aye. Six will pass. That motion carries. Thank you so much. Um, I will make the motion that tonight we adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor with an aye? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Good meeting tonight, folks. Thank you.